acting weird. Getting that to someone who can do forensics on it to find it, we are looking actively for US government backdoors. And if we can find it, I think that that's a really important thing to expose, right? Because that would be the equivalent of attaching a GPS device to your car. Now, which, yeah, well, they also do that as well. But the question has not really come up, right? There's a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the United States which says that it's illegal to break into people's computers. Why should the FBI get an exception for that? Because no one thought to write into the law that the FBI should not break into people's computers. I mean, that just seems ridiculous to me. Well, on Monday, not the last Monday, but the previous Monday, I went to an open society event where the deputy general counsel of the FBI was there. And um, the question was posed before me, before I asked my questions, um, does the FBI only need a subpoena to send malware to someone's phone in order to take it over? And she said, well, if there's no trespass, then in USA v. Jones, which is the GPS tracking case, you know, it's not clear exactly, but if it's tracking for more than 28 days, we know that's bad, but we don't know what exactly good is. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Yeah. But it gives you an idea about what kind of wiggle room these people really believe that they have. So they think in USA v. Jones that the only thing that really matters is that the GPS tracking device was attached to someone's car by trespass first, and then because it was tracked for a long time without getting a warrant, that this is essentially, those were the two problems. Like they should have gotten a warrant after 28 days, because that's too long, or before 28 days passed, and they, they of course should have had a warrant to trespass onto the property. So her line of reasoning in this was essentially that if we don't physically trespass by electronically putting it on the device, well, that's not trespassing. And well, if it's you know not, you know, if it's less than 28 days of tracking, well, you know, it sounds like a gray area. I'm just not sure about whether or not a subpoena is all we need. I'm not sure was pretty much her answer. I have to check on that. So that means that the Deputy General Counsel of the Federal Bureau of Investigation wasn't sure if breaking into your phones is something she needs a warrant for or a subpoena. So what do you think a national security letter does in that case? <laughs> well, considering that in some ways it's worse than it's worse than a warrant and yet has less oversight than a subpoena, that should be like pretty chilling, right? And the FBI builds these back doors. They write the software and they have them. Um, so targeted attacks like that are, are, are a serious problem as well. And we're looking for those. So if when you go to the courthouse, you find that your phone behaves differently, it might get one of those. Now, we've never found one of the FBI's bugs in the wild. But if we were to find one, it would be international news. If you think you have one of these, be very careful about getting it to me, but I would love to take a look at it because I have absolutely no fear at all about taking something like that public. That's a, something that needs to have national debate. Um, I heard that um, uh, rooting your phone or flashing your ROM on an Android uh, can disable the tracking feature. Um, I don't believe that, but um, does it at least um, make it impossible or more difficult for uh, FBI or NSA to put malware onto your phone? Um, does that help at all? Well, so the short answer is you have to separate them by threats. So the NYPD are incompetent boobs by comparison to the NSA. And the NSA are still government workers. So they have you know, a lot of resources, and there are a lot of them, and they have incredible abilities to do things. But it's still, for a lot of people, a nine to five job. So you have to divide first and determine who your threat is. If you're really worried about the NSA targeting you, which is actually my threat model in a lot of ways, you're screwed. That's it. Like, I mean, you can do stuff to take steps so that if they ever reveal your communications, you will show that they have broken into your computer. I do that. I use lots of crypto. I, I take a lot of steps to make it so that podunk cops in Seattle, where I live, don't get data on me. So wiretapping my internet connection is worthless. Right? And if they try to do targeted exploits and I catch them, then I would expose them. But if you're worried about the NSA doing targeted attacks against you, they're going to do attacks which are unbelievable. So for example, they will have what are called Tempest attacks. So they will look at the electromagnetic radiation of your house. Right? And so they will like be able to look at what your computer is doing that way. They don't just have to break in. They can also break in. But so, for example, they can look at your cell phone 
They can crack the crypto on the cell phone code. You can crack the crypto on the NYPD cell phone codes, by the way, that's another discussion. But, but just by doing passive interception, you can, you can do that. The NSA can absolutely break GSM and CDMA, those are the two competing cell phone standards. Absolutely can crack that, right? So making that call, the call, irrespective of whether or not your phone is cracked. Um, one useful thing that you can do, of course, is you can make it with like a rooted Android phone, you can make it so that um, you know, it's very difficult to push an application onto your phone through the carrier. So if you're trying to defend against the carrier for that specific thing, that might be possible. But probably not even that. You can do some things though that will protect you a little bit from passive attackers. So for example, if you have a rooted phone, all of your data on the phone can be routed over Tor or over a VPN or both or something like this. And there is there is value in doing that. I mean, you want to know that your device is yours, but you should never assume that there's such a thing as perfect security. So you have to compartmentalize things, right? Like just just try to think about it as different levels of an asshole that is abusive to you and is in your pocket. <laughs> so just because you've got like a thumb on his neck does not mean that he won't turn around and bite you, right? I just I just like I can't like tell you how frustrating it is, but the, the FBI basically puts these vulnerabilities or allows these vulnerabilities to exist is a better way to put it. They allow them to exist so as to maintain their so-called lawful interception capabilities. So when you travel abroad or you travel to another state, they want to be able to intercept your calls. And they're willing to allow anybody else with this technology to intercept your calls too, so that they maintain access. And I asked the FBI lady about that. And I said, why do you make it so that my job is harder to help secure activists abroad? And what about the fact that everybody, every businessman and businesswoman in America is a threat to this? And, and this is a risk for them, and, and when they travel abroad, it's a problem. And she said, well, I can't speak to what other people are gonna do when they break the law. We have a lawful ability to do this, and the statute allows us to do it, or something to that effect. So, securing your phone is like, it's about making some things you do more secure against certain attackers. But if you were worried about the state, throw your cell phone in the garbage, at least for some stuff. Or put it in a lockbox that is acoustically isolated and don't take it with you everywhere you go. Don't have important conversations in the room. Like pretend that it's a person you don't trust very much and you're willing to interact with it a little bit, but not all the way. I mean, we have to live with these devices. There's no question about it. The network effect means we all have to have cell phones, just like most people are on Facebook. We feel the social pressure to do it. If you want to have a job, if you want to be able to talk to your family, you have to talk to these phone networks. And the internet sort of solves this problem a little bit in that you can put just generic computers onto the internet without having to run all this proprietary software. So if you're running Ubuntu or the Tails operating system, which Tor funds and helps to build, which is based on Debian, um, that kind of stuff is a step in the right direction. But all of our data and all of our communications are essentially being put into small, easy to classify packets of data that are passed around. And there are machines that look at this data and then tell stories about us. So it becomes very like a very serious problem. And phones are the worst because they're designed for people to be able to spy on you, right? The whole Kalia law enforcement battle that happened in the 90s. I, I got the FBI woman to say, the C in Kalia, contrary to what other people might have you believe, does not stand for China, which was really like, <laughs> in my life, I'm glad I accomplished at least that. And uh, I mean, just really like unbelievable. I just kind of made that up on the spot. And she like made it sound like many people said it. Um, but if the FBI can tap you, so can the Chinese. So can any nationalist fervor thing of the day. But most importantly, it means that the technology is simply not secure. So there are other voice over IP telephony solutions which you can put onto a cell phone or put onto like an Android tablet. And we can talk about that and we will, but there's like seven questions. So before we go on to that, which is on the list, we should have it. Yeah. So I worry that um, some of what you said might instill a false sense of complacency about the capability of the NYPD. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how some of the things that are available to the NSA, like the technology and the databases and the export market, for instance, are also available to the NYPD and FBI? Yeah. They're more sort of threat model, I think. And Homeland Security. Yeah, yeah same around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so DHS, 
NYPD, and the FBI all have the ability, if they want, to buy software which is point and click simple to break into your phone. It is unlikely that the beat cop carrying a Nextel telephone with a gun standing on the corner of Zuccotti Park has that. It is extremely likely that the tactical van next to it has a computer with it installed. And that, I think, is important to distinguish. The way that they decide to target you in the real world, if you want to make a distinction between the internet and the so-called real world, when they decide to do that, whatever the criteria is, you move from that cop who's beating you with a nightstick to the cop that's in the van, or maybe somewhere else. And if it's the FBI, they absolutely can break into your computers. They have custom backdoors to do this kind of stuff, and they have people that work for them that write these exploits. And those people are willing to do it because it pays well, just like any military contracting stuff. So if the CIA and the NYPD are working together, you should not think that the NYPD are clueless. It is only by comparison to the NSA that I say that they are clueless, which is like saying that it's a short walk to the moon. So. Uh -huh. You know, relative to going to Pluto, it sure is. And, and the NYPD, I mean, they're brutal. I think it's also the case that they are, in, in, in a lot of cases, that they're very effective. And it doesn't seem to me that people care as much as I would like about the brutality physically. We have not yet understood their electronic signals and intelligence capabilities yet. But to give you an idea, you can buy for about $1,500 a small box, which you guys can buy and build also to use against them, but it is a serious felony, so maybe don't do it. <laughs> it's called a GNU radio. It's a software-defined radio, and you can basically program it to be a fake cell phone tower. So the police use this, and they call it so-called lawful interception. They call it a cell scope, or they call it an IMSI catcher, I-M-S-I. That device, you place it next to an activist, next to an activist's house, their phone jumps on that tower. When you make calls, it records it all automatically. Have you ever heard of a Femto cell or a mini cell base, which you can put in your house? Those, those devices, which AT&T sells, Nextel, I think, sells, T-Mobile, I think, sells, you plug it in and it uses your internet connection, and then phones jump on that tower. You can sometimes hack those to make MC catchers. So like for 100 bucks, you can make a, you know, an MC catcher. The scary thing, though, is that when they cost $100, the police have them too. And fundamentally, the police have an economic incentive to keep you vulnerable so that they can still have this access. So they can totally do that without understanding it. It's a device you just deploy. Right? If we look at the equipment that the NYPD has, they've got these LED projectors, they have all these security cameras with mesh Wi-Fi. I've been like sort of scoping out the city while I've been here and walking around noticing what a total police state New York is. <laughs> and like looking at all the different equipment, write down all of the vendor names. Take photographs of all of that stuff so that we can figure out how it works, so that we can do effective counter surveillance on it, right? So if they're using Wi-Fi, for example, for all those cameras, a Wi-Fi jammer, I'm not advocating its use, but it's an example that if you had a Wi-Fi jammer, maybe those cameras couldn't talk to each other anymore, and maybe someone couldn't see what they were seeing. So the interesting thing here is, of course, that means it works against you as well. These vulnerabilities are a serious problem. If you use Wi-Fi links for internet connections, they can probably jam it. So whatever you're building, you have to test somehow. And with cell phones, you can test if your cell phone is secure, or if a, a, if a you know if a piece of software on your phone is doing what it says it does by setting up one of these um, new radio devices or a USRP universal software radio. So one of the guys in the back that's really like a tech ops guy could probably talk more about it. But building one of those, it costs some amount of money. There are a bunch of universities around here; they have them in their labs, so you might be able to borrow them for a day. And using just free software, you can get your phone on it and see what you can do to your phone. And it might be useful, but the short version of it, even if you don't do any of that stuff, is that your phone is a snitch, treated appropriately. So, yeah? So at this point, is, it, is there any point in just deleting any of the phone numbers or any of the information from the phone, or is it, is it just over Do you believe that the broken window theory is a good way to describe society? So the broken window theory is this idea that you're in a city and you see a broken window and so you don't respect the neighborhood, you don't care about it, it's like, oh, it's all shit, you just throw it all away now. Because when you go into a neighborhood, do you treat it, if you see it looking sort of bad, you know, does that lead you to kill someone? Right, it, exactly right. So the broken window theory of surveillance, essentially, is, is, is that question. Which is like, well, if they've already got a lot of data on me, shouldn't I just give up? No. The answer is that you should never give up. We can totally effectively resist this kind of surveillance by making our new behavior safer. 
And so, you know, having a notepad is not safe against the NYPD seizing it. An encrypted cell phone might be safer against that. So if that's your threat model, you pull the battery on your phone when it's encrypted, they're not going to get your address book unless they get the password from you, probably. That's really, I think that's a that's a totally solid, great strategy for that. And the notepad is safer if you keep it next to a fireplace and you're willing to throw it in there at the very end. Both of those work depending on what you're trying to defend against. And so just because we live in a surveillance state doesn't mean we can't turn it around, right? The whole Occupy Wall Street idea of making the world a better place comes from the fact that we're in a bad place and we've got to turn the ship around before it gets significantly worse. At least that's my take on it. I, I mean, I don't know if I get any twinkles in that, but, but, but thanks. But, but, but we have to not accept, we, we must not accept a fatalistic view that because our cell phone has some data or we've already made those calls, that we're doomed. We just have to be aware of them and adapt ourselves. So let's say that you meet someone who has an inside leak in NYPD's police brutality or that they've been doing surveillance, right? Don't use your cell phone to call that person. That would be a link that if you were to create it, you would be now linked to that leak. But if you're aware of that, you just have your normal phone, keep it at home, like, oh no, I was, it's over there. What are you talking about? You ever met that person? Oh, I call every source I have on my telephone. Is there a record of that? No. Got the proof? Right? So that, I mean, that is something you can do. You can use your data trail against people that are trying to oppress you if you know what you're doing. Just, just think about it in that way. And all you have to do is think about it non-technically. Think about it in terms of actually having real people interacting. Pretend these interactions are photographed by someone. If you were, if someone produced a dossier of these things, what would it tell? And so this is sort of we can we can do the same thing electronically without understanding how the electronics betray us. If we get a camera across the street taking our photo, we don't have to get how it works. We just need to know that it's very similar to that and just act accordingly. Like, I believe that I'm electronically surveilled and probably physically surveilled. Anybody think that's unreasonable? No. Right, yeah, exactly. Sucks, but it's probably true. That doesn't make me not do stuff. It just means that I do stuff differently. Like, I'm aware of the fact that if I call someone on the phone, that might be a problem for them. So I call a lot of people I don't like on the telephone. <laughs> right? Like all the time, right? It's just like, what better way to make friends than to call people in the White House and say like, hey guys, do you stop harassing me? You wanna call me back? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Think, make that link bi-directional, thanks. Right, so I mean, think about this stuff. You can do some cool, you can do some really cool stuff with that. Um, and don't feel duped, right? Like that question, it comes from, uh, a question of agency, it's like, well, I'm not important, they're not going to watch me. Okay, they're watching me, I'm not doing anything interesting. Right? Those are the first two steps. And what we're doing is we're trying to say, okay, I don't have any control. <sighs> what can I do about this? Well, I don't have any control. And it makes sense, because it's super scary. It's super, super scary. There's no question, and I totally hear that. The next phase <coughs> is to talk about, well, I'm already in it, so I'm done. Well, the phase after that is the phase where we start to effectively resist it, and we say, it's not doomed, we can change these things, we can make it a lot better. And there are a lot of phases of this. It's like similar to the phases of grief or loss in some way. And we're going through that because we have lost things in the United States that are very serious, like, for example, social justice-related issues, but just due process in general. So when you start to see yourself going down that path, Ask yourself, well, what can I do about it? And if the answer is nothing about that thing, ask yourself what you can do about the greater system that creates no agency for that set of choices. I mean, so I hope that answers your question, and I hope it makes you smile a little bit, because it's really depressing to go down that path. And the answer, I think, is not technical. It's not about cell phones or about email or something like that. It's about big societal change. So, you had a question for a while? What are, what are specific rules or policies that one can advocate or demand that would make this process, uh, rather than just reacting to the rules that are being passed, but sort of specific things that the government cannot do, or, or if you will, like a, a data bill of rights or something. Yeah, so what we need is the church committee for the 21st century. Did anybody here know about the church committee that led to the FISA courts? Basically, Watergate, all sorts of things, Ellsberg, I'm summing up the 60s and 70s real quick here. Free love. Basically, as much as I like free data love, the thing that we will really need to do is to actually build 
some kind of accountability into the system. So I've been sort of saying we should start the widening commission, as in wrong widening from origin. Public laws, public interpretations, public accountability. So step one, no secret laws. This is the most fundamental thing in a democracy. No secret laws, no secret interpretations of laws. So if you're asking for a policy thing, that's a big one. The second thing is no warrantless wiretapping, but also no promotion of systems that are insecure and allow for wiretapping. Now that's a big jump there, and it's gonna take us probably my entire life for everybody to have that by default. But that's okay, we're, we're going places fast. So it might be possible. But those are some things that are important. Also, I mean, if you want to advocate for other things, remember, your internet activity ties to whether or not you're going to be killed by a drone. And that sounds like totally ridiculous shit until I tell you a story which is about two minutes. There's a guy, his name is Anwar al -Waki. You ever heard of him? Yeah. Right. OK. I don't like the guy. In fact, as a, you know, the person that I am, I think the guy is mostly full of shit. But he's also a human being. And I'm not an American exceptionalist. But he was an American citizen for writing emails and posting on YouTube and being kind of a hateful asshole. He got killed by a drone. So a lot of people are fine with that because he's a total asshole in their mind. Some people, surely someone in this room is okay with that, right? Come on, don't be shy. No, not one person? That's no, me too. Okay, all right, so thanks for being that guy. <laughs> the token guy. So here's the deal. He had a 16-year-old son. His 16-year-old son was in Yemen and was targeted and was killed by a drone as well. This was done without any judicial process whatsoever, and Eric Holder from the DOJ said, well, the Constitution guarantees due process, but not necessarily judicial process. So there was due process, because we say there was due process. And even though it's not like any due process we've ever had before, and it was a 16-year-old American boy, and was killed by a robot flying in the sky, it's legal. So there was a there was a process. I'm going to assure you about that. And it was two weeks later, James. Yeah, exactly. And so it was actually a totally separate strike. So this guy who just had his father killed by a fucking flying robot because of his posts on YouTube and emails he sent to people, no matter what the content, no matter what the content, killed without a trial. And his son, two weeks later, was assassinated. Now, is that going to happen to anybody here? Probably me. But anybody else? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> But, I mean, I'm not worried about it, right? I mean, if, if we're in that world, like, I'm not the only one, you know? I mean, there's, <laughs> misery loves company. And, I mean, I mean it, it is something to be worried about in the sense that when the United States literally goes around killing American citizens without trials, that is some super scary shit where everybody needs to take account and take stock of what it is that they're leaving behind. Because if you don't get a trial, you don't get to speak in your defense, and in fact, you're not even guilty for the son or the daughter of someone that is guilty or the friend of someone that is guilty. We have lost our right to freely associate to the point that we lose it with our lives at the same time. Now, maybe that won't happen in the United States. And I'd like to be the optimist in the room and say that that won't happen. So maybe it won't happen. The question is, who wants to be first? Right? So you want, I think, to minimize whether or not you're interested in this. I mean, when Benny, the guy from the NSA who was on Democracy Now!, he talks about this, he talks about America as the Weimar Republic. When a 40-year NSA veteran who fought the Cold War calls America the Weimar Republic, I don't even know what to think. I mean, that is unbelievable, because it sounds like the most ridiculous, over-exaggerated nonsense you can imagine. Like, surely not our America. I mean, sure, if you read Howard Zinn's People's history of the United States, like you might think, well, okay, it's consistent. <laughs> but even then, nobody wants to believe that that's happening. But it really is. That's a documented fact, and they will not even explain the process by which they killed this person. They just say, trust us. And that person killed is the son of someone that was a total jerk. Everybody deserves a fair trial. But the question is, historically, part of the group that you're a part of, whether it's racial, gender, religious, whatever, how is your group fair, historically? The groups that you're a part of. Like for me, as like an atheist, bisexual Jew, I'm gonna go on, uh, oh, and, and I'm, you know, I, I'm really, like Emma Goldman is one of my great heroes, and I really think anarchism is a fantastic principle by which to fashion a utopian society, even if we can't get there. Like, historically, that does not go well. 
<laughs> so here's the question. Do we really believe that things won't be like that? And I think that the answer is like, no. And that's why you're all here. So it is most important for you guys to contextualize these security culture things and these action things to try to protect yourselves. Because if you guys can't protect yourselves on the front line, I don't know what regular, everyday people who don't even care to take 10 seconds, what they will do. So that's my quick little story to answer your question. And I hope that it has convinced you drug killings are bad. <laughs> yeah, you have another question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, one of the things I'd love to get from today is whatever, I know this sounds really sort of a little too elementary, but just whatever sort of general set of do's or don'ts, when you say, if you contact me, be careful. You say, you know, throw away your cell phone if, they, if someone takes it from you. Yeah. Right, these are things I, I hadn't thought of that. But, you know, uh, I use TrueCrypt, you know, with a 26 character encryption on part of my hard drive. Is that worth doing even? You know, in, in terms of, my concern is general. I don't have a specific you know, threat profile on mine. I'm concerned about civil liberties, about, you know, the NSA, the federal government, and, you know, anything any one of us does could be deemed by somebody to be investigatable or wrong. So, you know, I'd love to know if a BlackBerry is better than, you know, if, if anything I can do to a BlackBerry that makes it better than everybody else's iPhone, if there's anything I can do to my hard drive that makes it more secure, or whether Tor is really an answer or not to most people's need for protection. Sure. I mean, so to rephrase it, you know, the question is, what's the question? And like, how do we do just basic stuff without, without an adversary in mind? Well, okay, so you have an adversary in mind. You have, you named a few of them. Yeah. And I think that TrueCrypt is actually an effective method of protecting your hard drive. I talked to a, an investigative journalist who also testifies in court cases, and he said that in his experience that people were able to recover data not from TrueCrypt disks, but from other disk encryption solutions like PGP disk. And I thought that was a pretty wild claim. And I don't know if that is substantiated by any kind of fact, but it's an interesting data point when someone who does forensics in a courtroom says that. So you're basically threat modeling around the idea that someone just steals your computer and they don't use any advanced forensics. So let's say they take your computer and they turn it off. That is not a given. But let's say that they do take your computer and they turn it off. A 26 character passphrase that's actually like a strong one, if they didn't put a keylogger on your computer, if they didn't target you, you are not the slowest running bear in the room. And you should take that if they take your data and they try to get you to give up your passphrase, you should fight it all the way. You should say, I have a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate myself. And if I tell you my passphrase, then obviously I'm the owner of, of that. Some of these have deniability built into it. Yeah, and so for example, Julian actually created, Julian Assange created the rubber host file system with deniable crypto, which was built in, which is similar to what TrueCrypt has. I think it's a different implementation, same idea. If you want to try that, I think that's awesome. You know, you can be the first to decide if TrueCrypt's deniability works. Ah. I personally would take the go fuck yourself route, but that's just my personality. So, I mean, I have like a, a lot of attitude towards authority, and if you want to try to be smart about it and like say like, well, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong, and oh yeah, here's my passphrase. It's I love the police, and it's like a hidden volume that's you know deniable passphrase. If you want to do that, that's fine, but you probably will get in a shit ton of trouble in that, um, you know, if you lie about that being your only passphrase under oath, that's a, like, that in itself is a crime, right? So I don't know that I trust those systems. I think it's really important for us as a community in general, like the human community, to look at these systems and try to evaluate whether or not those claims are true. So this is why I think it's so important to have free and open source software instead of proprietary software. Because it's really difficult to evaluate someone's claims if you can't actually see how the claims are implemented. So it's kind of the benefit of something like Android or Ubuntu Linux over, say, Mac OS or, or Windows. There are trade-offs to that. So you have to make your own choice. If you're using Windows and TrueCrypt, you might have problems with Windows. For example, accidentally writing the cryptographic key out to the hard drive. Or if they get your computer when it's on, I think the TrueCrypt people protect against that. But if they get your computer when it's on, the attack that Aaron mentioned, the cold boot attack where they pull your RAM, or they plug in a Firewire card to your computer, they pull the memory out, they get the keys, and you never need to guess your passwords. It has to be off and cold for however long. Right. And 
the, the funny thing is I don't have anything I'm desperate to protect. I'm just desperate to protect. Sure you do. It's called your liberty. Right. that I attended this meeting and therefore they want to remote me find out what's on my hard drive. Yeah, they're gonna. They, if they decide to do that, you are fucked. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying that mostly so that the segment won't be used by television people. None of this has any use. Well, no, it does have a use, which is that now. Okay, so here's the deal: if your hard drive is encrypted and they take your computer and they want to go to court, they either have to guess the passphrase, so pick a, a sentence out of a book which is your favorite, and use that, and then whatever password you made up, or a song. They're never going to guess it, assuming they haven't backdoored your computer or taken your keyboard. They now have to ask you, and they will ask you. And then you get to decide whether or not you're going to give your data up. What it does is it buys you time. So don't think about it as perfection. Think about it as buying you time. So if you needed to buy time in a way